No role plays, no conference calls, no BS. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of combined experience to help you become a more effective leader. This is Hacking Your Leadership. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris. And I'm Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, on this episode, I want to talk about an infograph that I saw online. Um, it was kind of put out by uh, Intuit. And the, the infograph is 10 ways you're making your employees less productive. And I'm going to read them all, but there's a couple of them that I want to focus on um, because I think they they kind of deserve more time because they're the ones that I see happening more often in, in when it comes to leaders. Other ones of these, I'm, I'm sure they happen, but um, it's it's less a, a problem of an individual leader and more about company culture as a whole. Uh, and so we don't necessarily need to focus on those. Um, number one is being a bottleneck, which is you know, it's it's pretty obvious. You know, give, give your employees more authority. Uh, you know, if you're if you're kind of trying to micromanage everything that they do, that's a that can be an issue. Um, number two, not truly delegating responsibilities. We've had episodes about this on, you know, delegating versus, you know, assigning things or, you know, making people feel like you've delegated them something, but in, in actuality, you're just kind of expecting them to do your dirty work for you or things you don't <laughs> want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, number three is not conveying clear expectations. Yeah, I, I mean, the clarity is the third is the is the middle tier of your of your three pillars. Your vision, clarity, and support. We could go on for episodes on not giving clear expectations. Uh, number four is not giving useful feedback. Uh, we, again, we've talked about this ad, ad infinitum. Um, you know, feedback needs to be very specific on what a person did right or wrong, and and it needs to be something that they can use to make themselves better, not just something that they can use to make your life easier as a leader. Uh, number five is no concentration time. You know, depending on the kind of, kind of environment that you're in, that might be something that em- employees need. Uh, in the retail space, a little bit more difficult because the the, the nature of the job. Um, number six uh, is one of the ones I want to really focus on. We'll come back to it in a minute here, and that's neglecting employees' needs for better job performance. Number seven, not letting people telecommute when the work allows it. And I think that's that's amazing. These you know companies that have these blanket policies of we're all work from home or we're all in the office, it, that, that one size fits all thing is really one size fits none. Um, number eight, insisting on a doctor's note to take sick days. I mean, I, I don't know that I could work for a company that, that wanted that most most times I've been sick. I don't need to go to a doctor, right? Like this is just, I don't want to, you know, I want to spread it to my coworkers. Um, number nine is the second one that I really want to focus on. Uh, and that's scrimping on training time. Uh, so we'll go back to that one. And then lastly, creating a climate of fear and anxiety, which is kind of just an, an overall, you know, if there's no psychological safety, if people can't challenge each other, then that, that can be a problem, um, when, when it comes to leadership. But let's go back to, to number six, because I, I think this is something that I see often is neglecting employees' needs for better job performance. The, the infograph says most employees won't speak up on their own if they need a faster computer, newer software, or other tools, being proactive and asking what your team's needs are. Um, I, I This isn't just when it comes to like the tools. I mean, you know, on, and on every engagement survey that I've ever uh, administered, there's always people who say that they don't have the tools that they need to get their work done. But when I, where I see neglecting employees' needs for better job performance, it's when I see leaders make decisions that are in the moment that, that might be beneficial for that moment, but that are eroding their tr- the, the employees' trust in them long term in order to get that, you know, that whatever that eek of performance is for that moment. What, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I think there's, there's two things that stick out to me most here. I think you talked a little bit about it, but like there's some systems and processes where um, you, you know, you've ever gone anywhere, shopped anywhere, done anything where somebody's just like, I'm so sorry, these computers are so slow. They're always so slow. <laughs> you know, like, um, you know, yeah, yeah, I wish I could do that, but unfortunately we can't. Like you find these systems and processes that are either antiquated, they haven't been adjusted, they could be fixed um the, you know and, and of course think some of these cost money and things like that but if at the end of the day what you're trying to create is the opportunity for your employees to be more effect, more efficient, more effective, and be more productive? These are things that you must address. So I think that there is a systems and tools and processes part of this. And I think the other piece of it is what you also spoke a little bit about, which is the kind of the in the moment element of understanding um, from the team. What do they need? Are you asking the question uh, around like, 
if there's something here that we could do that would help you to be more productive, or there's something here that would help you to accomplish the things that you work on in a, in a faster manner, more efficient manner. Like if you're not asking those questions proactively to kind of discover what these things might be, you'll never know if you can address them quickly. You can make a small tweak. You can, you know, uh, maybe bubble some of the information up. And then what ends up happening to your point is that you wait once or twice a year and say, do you feel like you have the tools to do your job? And then somebody's like, no, right? Like instead of constantly having dialogue around that. And and I think that that's something that uh, when you start to ask these types of questions, you start to find out there are some really easy, small fixes that can be done um, that not only can help the team and individuals become more productive, but it gives them a chance to know that that they're in, you know, that they're having an impact on whether it be the strategy or the approach, um, and they start to feel more empowered to continue to share the things that would be helpful in making people more productive uh, and more efficient in their roles. Yeah, that's so true. The, I think where I see this happen in leaders, they think that. It's it's not that they they believe that all that's needed is the decision in the moment. It's that they they rationalize that this particular moment in time, whatever it is, is an emergency. You know, it's 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 I need I can't focus on the long term needs of my employees. I need to focus on the performance of the moment because this is the pressing customer. This is the pressing client. This is the moment where we don't have enough resources and we need to ask people to kind of pull out all the stops. You know, there will never be a shortage of those things. There will never you that will never go away. There will always be something that you can find as a distraction for long-term job performance and, and productivity and and commitment out of out of your employees. And, and the reason why leaders do that is because it's tough. It, it's hard to do the things necessary, harder to do the things necessary for long-term job performance than it is for the moment because it requires genuine investment in the relationship between you and the employee. It requires knowing what makes each employee tick. You know, neglecting employees' needs for better job performance, it could be as simple as whatever type of recognition they want for the job performance they've already done. And in your mind, you might be thinking, well, that's their job. Like, they should be doing their job. Yeah, so? If the difference between them doing well or not doing well is feeling like they're being recognized for doing well, then guess what? That's your job as a leader is to make them rec feel recognized for the for the job that they're doing, even if they're doing things that you would consider to be cost of admission. Like, yeah, the, here's your recognition. It's just, it's the paycheck, right? And you think, let's recognize them for, for going above and beyond or doing something out of the ordinary. I, I mean, you better be doing that too, but... If, but just feeling recognized in the moment in the way that they want to be recognized is a really important thing for a lot a lot of employees and and sometimes what employees need in order to perform better is they've lost that connection to the overall mission or vision of the organization or of your team they feel like they're just going through the motions and, and and you being able to kind of bring them back into that and and really define why it is that your organization exists and, and why it is that they're being asked to do certain things, being able to tie that back in is really difficult for leaders to do if they don't, if they aren't in the habit of doing it all the time, because they can lose sight of it themselves. And then they can start going through the motions because they just, in their mind, it's the job, it's what they're supposed to do. And if they lose that tie into the broader mission, it may not impact a, a leader's ability to perform at the, at the highest level um, from, a, from a job delivery standpoint. But you know where it will impact? A leader's performance is in, in their ability to bring their team along because if they aren't seeing that vision and that mission in their daily work there's no way they can convince their team that that mission and that vision is alive and well in their daily work yeah no i i, I agree with that completely i think that you know again in the context of of having employees be less productive um what you what you spoke about from recognition to just overall engagement understanding interacting with the team under you know like like not just understanding what's happening but being a part of um bringing the team in and building strategy collectively i think as the leader like i think there's many times when um, you know, we spend time in leadership kind of uh, implementing strategies that are being asked of us to go out there and kind of execute and validate um, and, and finding the times to uh, bring the team in and, and make them a part of that dialogue. 
I think in this context is so important because what you're really asking for is like, how do we how do we become more productive? Not for the sake of just like the outcome or the output and that being the major priority, but for the idea of building a, a team where people have a pride in the collective results that they have and they want to be able to be more, um, you know, more productive because they know that they're capable of being more productive and that it's something that we are all working on together and we're solving together. And I think that that's such an important part of of you know, building a culture of a high performing team is that people not only want to just do what's expected, but they are saying like, what other ways can we do things to make this where we are all effective, more effective together and that we can be very proud of the outcomes that we produce. The other one I want to go over here is number nine on the list, which is scrimping on training. Uh, you know, this is, this is a, a tale as old as time in a lot of organizations. Uh, I, I, you and I worked for the same organization for many years where we saw the amount of time devoted to training for, let's just call it a brand new employee just plummeted. Um, and, and it just, you know, little, little bits taking away here and there. Um, I remember, I remember running new employee orientation for many employees over the years when the time that I was given as a leader to kind of organize this and actually deliver it to a group of new employees went from 30 or 35 hours over the course of the first week or first two weeks to all of a sudden four or eight hours where half of it was the videos that we were expected to show them. And then the rest of it was what they said basically is, well, you know, it's better for them if they learn while doing, which sounds really good, right? Like I learned better while doing. That doesn't mean you know, throw them into the deep end of the pool and hope they, they hope they survive. Learning by doing needs to be a very intentional part of training that, that that coincides with a lot of the other materials or interactions that you're having, getting to know people, meeting the meeting your coworkers. And then learning by doing is something that is done when you believe they already have the tools and the knowledge they need. And now it's time for them to demonstrate what they've learned. It's not Let's change the color of the shirt this person's wearing so that so that clients and customers don't they understand that, oh, this person is not a good representation of the brand yet. So don't judge us too harshly by their interactions. And then let's let's see what they can do. That is that's a terrible way, one, to make an employee feel like they're part of a new organization. It's a terrible way to uphold your brand standards as an organization. And it's why a lot of employees end up burning out and leaving during the first six months because they feel like they've been hung out to dry. Um, you know, the, the training that is required for not just new employees, but ongoing for employees in, in order to just, you know, learn whatever is new, but also to revisit things that they may not have revisited is so important. And, and a lot of leaders believe that it's like a one and done. Well, we, we you learned this one seven years ago. We can we don't have to revisit this anymore. It, it, your time is better spent earning money for the organization, not sitting in front of a computer. And and that is a it's a really dangerous mindset, I think, for leaders to go through if they think that uh, that no training is needed or at least very little is needed. And it's all about what they're doing in the moment. Yeah, I think it's it's always one of the first things that typically is looked at when it comes to things like cost cutting and adjustments and whatnot. And and, and I you know firmly believe that when you recruit and hire people, you want to find people that have. Um, talent already and skill already in, in the job that you have. I think that, that just makes sense when you can when you can do that. That doesn't mean, however, that they are clear on what exactly it is that you know uh, and, and how we do things in this certain scenario, or this certain organization. And I think that that training piece is important because it's not just about the time spent, like how do I work a system? How do I do this? What's the approach here? But there's an element of building trust and, and bonding a team that happens with both the trainer who is working with them. And, th and that becomes kind of this, um, kind of in, in many cases, this, this unassigned mentor um, that's bringing this person into an organization, but also the other people that are being hired along with them. That team building element, the time they get together to learn together, to to figure things out, to understand what the new job expectations are, to, to, to establish those relationships. When you cut that training short, you're also cutting short those opportunities to build those relationships that are going to need to be leveraged when people run up against things that maybe they've never seen before um, or are difficulties um, or you know they don't have necessarily the relationship 
relationships or the trust yet to go in and be vulnerable to say, hey, I'm struggling with this or I don't know how to do this. Can you show me um, if, if that time hasn't happened? And a lot of times that happens over the course of training uh, because that's the space where you can say you're here to be trained on something that you've never done before or not done here. So it's okay for us not to know the answers. And so like you, the more time that you have that space, the more opportunities you have for people to really connect on an individual level, on a personal level, which is really helpful as they kind of onboard into the organization uh, and with the rest of the team. Right. And, and it's also important for kind of just for making sure that the expectations are are continually met as you move forward. The Some of the most untrained employees I've ever met aren't people who've been in the job for six months. They're people who've been in the job six years. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they, the way that they execute what they think they're supposed to be doing, you can tell that it has that there's been this kind of game of telephone that has happened over the course of the six years they've been with the organization where maybe they the, the way they executed something was done really well and then very slowly over time it eroded and it eroded because there was not the the continued commitment to making sure that the the brand standards were followed and that the interaction standards were followed and that you know that you cut little corners here and there and eventually that becomes the way and then you know where that really impacts you is when you think oh this is a senior person who's here they really know what they're doing let's put the new employees with them because they know what they're doing and then you get new employees who are trained the wrong way of doing things because they're being trained by somebody who really doesn't know how to do it the right way themselves and they haven't done it the right way for years and and so when you're talking about you know being very intentional on training new employees it starts with being very intentional on on making sure that all of your seasoned employees really not just know what they're supposed to do, but that they execute it well. They can't just regurgitate it to you and then they dismiss you when you walk away and then do things the way they want to do, but they are held accountable to a standard of what that execution looks like so they can be trusted to you know, convey that information to new employees. That's how you have the slow degradation of a brand over time. And you hear that from from customers, customers and clients that will that will reach out and say, this isn't what I thought it was going to be, or I had a different experience in in one location versus another location, if there's, if there's a multi-location organization. Um, if you can make sure that your, your, your seasoned employees who you send these new employees to know what they're doing, you will be, you'll be doing a lot for the brand standards as a whole um, because the new employee will understand, oh no, this is a job expectation is to do these things. This, you know, we, we, we adhere to these standards because we see the value in adhering to them over the long term and with every person. Absolutely. And with that, it brings us to this episode's one minute hack. But first, a few words from our sponsors. All right, for this episode's One Minute Hack, here's what I want you to do. We're going to post a link to this uh, infograph in the podcast description, so open it up and look at it. Remember that productivity is how do you make sure that you're getting the most out of the resources that you have? Time, people, um, you know, wh- whatever it is that you have is, is always going to be finite from a resource standpoint. What are you doing to get the most out of those resources? And, and a lot of times what that means to leaders is talking about a person's productivity. Hey, how well did you do this last month or this last quarter? How long do you actually spend talking about productivity as a goal? What do you think of the things that we can do to be more productive? How are you asking your people to be involved in that conversation on ways that they think the organization can do things differently in order to be more productive? Read through these lists of 10 things and think about the, the, the ways where you might be, you know, making your employees less productive. Where are the things that kind of jump out to you as, as saying, oh, you know what, maybe I do this a little too much. Maybe I can focus on this element of it because productivity isn't something to look back on and say, oh, this is what you did. Now try to get better. It's something you have to look forward on and, and talk about the things that can be done in the moment in order to improve it, not just tell your employees, hey, this was your level of productivity. Now change it or get better. If they don't know how to change it or get better, then it will be no more than just the same as it was uh, you know, the previous month or the previous quarter. Help them get better on it by making sure that you're not the one hurting their productivity to begin with. Yeah, I think it's a great hack. And, and when I look at some of these, I, I like that you think it, that you considered and talked about like self-reflection and where are things that we can work on. Because there are definitely a few of these that over time, um, I would have held on to heavily 
um, as a leader and been like, nope, like I have to be the one that rubber stamps everything that we're going to do. And that's like being the bottleneck. Right. And there's sure. been times when it's like, you know, um, like, like where, I, where I'm not really truly delegating responsibilities, maybe I'm assigning something, but I'm also very much micromanager and all way too much involved in that. Um, there are times when it's like, Hey, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not being clear enough about my expectations. Like these are all things that I think from a leadership standpoint um, that many of us have either worked through or are continuing to work on. And so I think a, a part of that is is this, taking the time to look through these and think about it and being like, well, I- am I this as a result of uh, like uh, something that's out of my control, like it's like like the insisting on a doctor's note to take sick days, like that might be a company policy somewhere. Right? Like so, you might not have any flexibility per se in some of these types of situations, but most of the time you do. Most of the time, as a leader of people, you have some leeway in a lot of these that you know really should be considered and thought about uh, when you are looking to help to make your team uh, more productive. Right. The, the two that I look at for me are ones that I initially thought, oh, this don't apply. This doesn't apply to me. But if you look at it, if you if you really look deeply into it, it it's where I kind of have to look at myself in the mirror a little bit. Number four, not giving useful feedback. Uh, the first thing I thought was I give plenty of feedback. Okay. okay. The, the, the key word here is useful feedback. Is, is the feedback you're giving actually things that your employees can take with them to get better at their job? Are, are, are they, you, you'd be giving plenty of feedback, but if it's attaboys, that doesn't really do much for the employee in order to, you know, continue doing the, the good things and to stop doing the things that are, that are kind of hurting their career. And then number 10, creating a climate of fear and anxiety. You know, I, I read that as a, as like one whole thing and think I don't create a climate of fear anywhere. It's like, no, no, no. The, the, the operative word here possibly might be anxiety. Maybe you don't mm. rule with an iron fist and create fear in your, in your teams, but if you always seem like you're running around like a chicken with its head cut off, you could be creating climate of anxiety in your people where they feel like, what, what, is, what is Chris going to be worried about in the moment? Let's, let's figure out what, uh, how, how best to mitigate the, uh, the anxiety that Chris brings to the team. And, and that's a great way to get your employees not focusing on what the long-term goals are, but really just focusing on whatever fire they think you're going to be throwing out at them in the moment. So look at these word for word and don't think that it's, a, you know, it's an overarching thing. You might not create any fear in your employees at all, but you may be creating anxiety. You may give a ton of feedback, but it's not useful. Absolutely. And with that, it brings us to the end of this episode. This is Hacking Leadership. I'm Lorenzo. And I'm Chris. And we'll talk to you all next time.